Christy Pondiff said. What Christy Pondiff said. What Christy Pondiff said. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Hello and welcome to What Does the Bible Say? Where I take a topic and do an in-depth study to see what the Bible has to say about it. Today I'll be taking a look at church health. When most people think about church health, the first thing that they think about is numbers. If attendance is consistently growing, then the church must be healthy. If attendance is consistently declining, then the church must be dying. Although it is true that a healthy church might grow in number and a sick church may decline in number, the opposite might also be true. A sick church may become healthy when a cancerous group of people is removed from its body, or a healthy church may become sick when a false prophet comes into leadership and attracts a cult following. Measuring the health of a church by its facilities, programs, music, income, or attendance would be the same as judging a person by his outward appearance instead of looking at his heart. When Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse to select one of Jesse's sons to be the next king, God corrected Samuel in what to look for. 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7 says, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As we go through this study, we will see that the same principle applies to churches. Not once does God say that the church should be physically appealing to the world. Instead, every issue that God addresses is a matter of the heart, and that the root of every issue is sin. Let's begin by defining what church is. The Greek word translated church is Strong's 1577 Ecclesia, which means a calling out, as in a meeting, a congregation, or an assembly. Although translators don't use the word church in the Old Testament, they do use the words meeting, congregation, and assembly. And there is a Hebrew word that means something called out, as in a public meeting. That word is Strong's 4744 Mikra, which can be translated as assembly, calling, or reading, but is most often translated as convocation, as in a holy convocation. A holy convocation that occurs every week is the Sabbath. Leviticus 23, 1-3 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. This instruction is the basis for what we know of today as church. Many people would say that the idea for church came from the book of Acts and the explosive growth that took place after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the apostles and other first century believers were simply following God's instructions that were given in the Old Testament. The idea to assemble together as a body and worship God didn't come from Peter or Paul. It came from God. He commands us to do it. So it makes sense that his word would instruct us in how to assemble in a healthy way and how to deal with problems that arise in the body. The first congregation or assembly of believers found in scripture is Israel. Exodus 12, 1-7 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. The Hebrew word translated congregation is Strong's 57.12, Edah, which means a stated assemblage. And the word translated assembly is Strong's 69.50, Kahal, which also means assemblage. 
Israel was not an assembly or a congregation in the sense that we think of today, but they were a united body who had faith in God and who were in a covenant relationship with him. In some passages, they are referred to as the assembly or congregation of the Lord. For example, Numbers 20, 1 through 4 says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? So before the assemblies of God was a denomination, there was Israel. As we can see just from this passage, Israel was not a healthy church. The people frequently grumbled, complained, and disobeyed God. One of the keys to a healthy church is good leadership, but Israel had problems in spite of having a good leader in Moses. Moses was far from a perfect man, but God called him, he answered, and he did his best to obey. What made Moses a good leader was his faith. Hebrews 11:23 through 29 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Our churches today need leaders with faith like Moses, who are willing to forsake the world and follow wherever the Holy Spirit leads. We need leaders who will consistently seek God's will and who will intercede on behalf of their congregations in the way that Moses did. Good leadership will not guarantee a healthy church, but it is an important first step. That's why God set high standards for those in leadership. In Exodus 18, when Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, sees that Moses is overwhelmed with trying to lead by himself, Jethro advises Moses to select some men to help him, but not just anyone. Exodus 18, 19-23 says, Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk, and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. We see here that Moses is to select able men of truth who fear God and hate covetousness. More qualifications for leaders are found in the New Testament. Acts 6, 1-4 says, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Here we see high standards even for positions of service. The apostles were looking for seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, to serve widows. Many churches today settle for whoever they can get when looking for volunteers. I have personal experience in running a food pantry in which I inherited some volunteers 
who did not have a good reputation, were not full of the Holy Spirit, and did not have wisdom. These people were a constant source of trouble and conflict, and greatly inhibited our ability to minister to the community. Their lack of spiritual health and lack of interest in becoming spiritually healthy made our ministry unhealthy. We find more qualifications for leaders in 1 Timothy 3, 1-13, which says, This is a faithful saying, If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. In Titus 1, 5 through 5-9 says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. One might think that these qualifications are straightforward and self-explanatory, and yet I consistently see people in church leadership who don't meet these qualifications. The most common issue that I see are leaders who do not rule their own house well and who are husbands of multiple wives. I understand that most people probably interpret being a husband of one wife to mean not being a polygamist, but I believe that this instruction also means to not be divorced, to not be remarried if you are divorced, to not be an adulterer, and to not be addicted to pornography. A house that is ruled well is not immune to sin. However, the leader of that home confronts sin and roots it out. The leader who rules his house well does not make excuses for sin, tolerate sin, or sweep offenses under the rug. Sin is dealt with openly, repentance takes place, and healing and restoration is the goal. It is not likely that a house that is ruled well will be broken apart by divorce. One of the problems with having leaders who have been divorced and married multiple times is that they have proven themselves to either be poor judges of character, poor decision makers, poor at reconciliation, quarrelsome, quick-tempered, lacking in self-control, or some combination thereof. This does not mean that people who have made mistakes can't learn from those mistakes and minister in some way to people who are going through similar experiences. It just means that they shouldn't be in positions of leadership. I know pastors who have been married multiple times who refuse to confront sin in their congregations because they don't feel morally qualified to take a stand. Their attitude is, who am I to say that what they're doing is wrong? I've been guilty of the same thing. My response is that God's word determines what is right and wrong, not us. If we have repented of a sin, then we are no longer guilty of that sin, and we are not being hypocritical if we confront someone else who is walking in sin. Jesus gives very clear instructions for how to deal with sin in the body in Matthew 18:15 through 17 which says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. 
But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him beat you like a heathen and a tax collector. Many churches are sick and dying because they refuse to follow these simple instructions. If a pastor, deacon, or elder feels unqualified to confront sin, then they have no business being in a leadership position. The number one job of a shepherd is to protect his flock. Leaders who refuse to confront sin, either in their own lives or in the lives of their flock, are creating a safe haven for the enemy in which the enemy can steal, kill, and destroy. From my observation, the biggest cause of spiritual sickness in our churches today is sexual sin. The sins of adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and pornography not only exist in many churches, but are often ignored, tolerated, or even condoned. Paul did not tolerate sexual sin or any other sin in the churches to which he wrote, because he knew that God is holy and he expects his people to be holy. God's love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness don't give us permission to be unholy. They are what enable us to pursue holiness. Paul has strong words for those who tolerate sin within the church. 1 Corinthians 5, 1-13 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that low leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. The modern church seems to think that putting away from yourselves the evil person is unloving. But actually, the opposite is true. Allowing the evil person to stay gives the enemy permission to continue to hurt innocent people and to spread sin throughout the body like a cancer. A church that refuses to deal with sin will never be healthy. The Bible is full of examples of God dealing with sin within the body of believers, beginning with the congregation of Israel. Immediately after making a covenant with God at Mount Sinai, while Moses was up on the mountain with God receiving the law, many of the children of Israel grew impatient and made a golden calf to worship. This made God so angry that he was ready to kill them all and start over with Moses. But Moses, being the good leader that he was, interceded on their behalf and God relented from what he originally wanted to do. However, he didn't let them off without a consequence. After Moses goes down the mountain, breaks the tablets, and confronts Aaron, who failed as a leader in this case, Exodus 32:25 through 35 says, Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side, and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about three thousand men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. 
Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh, these people have committed a great sin, and have made for themselves a god of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out from your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. This is just one of many examples. Leviticus 10, 1-3 says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. In Numbers 14, when the Israelites refused to enter Canaan, God punishes them for their unbelief. They are forced to wander in the wilderness for forty years, and none of the men twenty years old and above are allowed to enter the promised land except for Joshua and Caleb. Also, the ten bad spies are killed by a plague. In number 16, Korah leads a rebellion against Moses and Aaron, but God immediately puts it down in dramatic fashion. First, God causes the earth to open up and swallow Korah and the men with him. Then a fire comes down from the Lord and consumes 250 men who are offering incense. In the next day, when all of the congregation complains against Moses, God causes a plague to quickly spread among the people. When Aaron takes a censer with fire in it and stands between the dead and the living, the plague stops. But by then, 14,700 people had died in addition to those who died with Korah. In Numbers 25, the Israelites begin to commit harlotry with the women of Moab and to worship other gods. And once again, God's anger is aroused, and 24,000 people are killed in a plague before Phineas ends it by thrusting a javelin through an Israelite man and a Midianite woman who sinned together in the sight of Moses and the congregation. Some might look at those examples and say, what an angry and hateful God the God of the Old Testament was. How could a loving and merciful God kill so many of his chosen people? Saying or thinking something like that ignores the great sin of the people that were killed. In these examples, God is punishing sinners who have hardened their hearts toward him, not the innocent or repentant. God is removing sin from his congregation so that those who truly love him can be saved. Another example of this is found in Numbers 21, 4-9, which says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is the incident to which Jesus refers in John 3, when he is speaking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who has come to him at night. John 3, 10-21 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. A healthy church brings sin into the light where it can be dealt with. A sick church loves darkness rather than the light, and hides their sins in darkness. John 8.12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If the church is following Jesus, it will not walk in darkness. It will have the light of life, and it will live by the standards set forth in God's word. In the early New Testament church, there was controversy about who should be allowed to fellowship. There were Jews who said that everyone had to be circumcised, but the council in Jerusalem decided that was too much to put on new believers. James says in Acts 15, 18-21, Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. The council in Jerusalem understood that God is holy and that he expects his people to be holy. But they also understood that sanctification, or becoming holy, is a process that happens in stages throughout our lives. It doesn't happen overnight. So instead of hitting them with everything at once, they pick four things for them to start with, with the understanding that the rest of God's commands would be learned as they heard Moses read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Many churches today have no standards for fellowship, and very few churches teach their congregations to obey God's commands. It is true that churches should be reaching out to the lost and inviting the unsaved to come and hear God's word. And yes, all people should be treated with love and respect and should not be judged by outward appearances. However, there has to be standards. People cannot be allowed to come in wearing bikinis, carrying their favorite idol, and drinking from a vial of blood. If they are open to hearing the gospel, then they won't be offended when they are offered clothes and asked to leave their idols and blood outside. It is possible for a healthy church to have members who are spiritually sick, but only if those members are being ministered to and have a desire to become healthy. Every congregation that Paul wrote to had problems, but instead of turning a blind eye to their issues the way that leaders do today, he confronted them. He called sin, sin, and he gave them instructions for how to make things right. We already read one example of this in 1 Corinthians 5. There are many more examples that we could look at, but I'll just share a couple more. Galatians 5, 16 through 6, 10 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, 
considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Here the church in Galatia is clearly told what activities are sin and what not to do, and they are clearly told what fruit they should be striving to produce instead. We also see that attempts should be made to restore someone who is overtaken in trespass. In other words, sin within the body should not be ignored and swept under the rug. It should be dealt with in love. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8 says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Again we see that a healthy church is a holy church. In the book of Revelation, Jesus has a message for the churches in regards to their spiritual health. In Revelation 2, 4-5, through 5, he says this to the church in Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. To the church in Smyrna, he says in verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. In verses 14 through 16, he says to the church in Pergamos, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To the church in Thyatira, he says in verses 20 through 23, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. In Revelation 3, 1-3, he says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that you are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And then Revelation 3, 7 through 22 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, 
for ye have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Of the seven churches that Jesus addresses, the only church that is not rebuked for something is the church in Philadelphia. Jesus commends them for keeping his word, for not denying his name, and for obeying his command to persevere. It is important to note that all of the other churches are in danger of losing their salvation if they don't repent and overcome. If Jesus wrote a letter to your church, what do you think he would say? I have a feeling that there are many churches who are in danger of having their lampstand taken away because they have forgotten their first love, given sin a foothold, and have become comfortable with being lukewarm. Instead of being set apart from the world, they have become almost indistinguishable from the world. We need to remember that the church is not a building, a corporation, or a social club. It is an assembly of people who have answered the call to follow Jesus. The purpose of assembling together is not to be entertained, it is to have a holy convocation in which God is worshipped in spirit and in truth as his word is read and his people are edified. The body of believers should be iron sharpening iron as they strengthen and encourage each other to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Here are some of Paul's instructions for the church. Ephesians 5, 1-21 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Colossians 2, 12-17 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Churches who do these things will be healthy churches. We don't need fancy facilities, world-class musicians, or seminars led by church growth experts. We simply need to read and obey God's word out of love for him and love for others. Well, that's all that I have for today. Until next time, I pray that God will bless each of you as you read and study his word.